Hi, everybody. So my name is Angela Walsh, and we met earlier on the panel. But um, I'm here from San Antonio, um, law professor, St. Mary's University School of Law. And I'm also a research fellow at University College London's Center for Blockchain Technologies. So it's a real honor for me to be here in Scotland uh, with you today for Scotchain. I um, love Scotland and wish I could stay a lot longer, not least of which is because it is still uh, something like 85 to 90 degrees in San Antonio, which I can't even translate that, but it's like a million in Celsius, I think. <laughs> so um, today I am going to talk to you about um, something that is near and dear to my heart, which is thinking critically about blockchain technology. Um, I think that we are all better off, in a sense, if we really understand what we're doing and try hard to push on assumptions that we're making, and I think that enables better decisions to be made overall. So um, that is the overall theme of my talk today. Now, I'm really happy to be here in Edinburgh because this is the home of the Scottish Enlightenment. Okay? Um, and I think that has a lot of resonance, actually, for what we're seeing today in the, all, the, all the activities and the discussions about blockchain technology. So during the Enlightenment, people were questioning everything. They were trying to figure out how you really know things, right? We have to prove them. We're going to emphasize rational thought and not just take dogma that has come to us from above. We're going to think through things ourselves. Okay, so at this time, you had people having, you know, active discussion groups, reading books carefully, um, talking about these big issues, big questions in universities and all kinds of settings. And I think we actually see echoes of that in the meetups that are happening in Edinburgh, in Glasgow, but really all over the world as people are trying to figure out, you know, how can we best use this technology? The goals of Enlightenment figures were also to try to make the world a better place, okay, to emphasize um, virtue and improvement of both the individual and society as a whole. And I have seen a lot of those same kind of noble motivations in people who are working with the technology and trying to build it to make the world a better place. So um, I think that this is kind of um, an image that, uh, that is helpful to kind of frame our talk today, okay? Because I think it's important to try to get to a more enlightened state in our thinking about the blockchain. And um, I looked up what enlightened means, or enlightenment means, and it means that you are seeking to have a complete picture of something. And to me, that means that a complete picture takes into account the, the perks, the cons, like the good, the bad, everything about something. Okay, so um, the complete picture s seeks to acknowledge everything about something. So today we're going to um, talk about several different things. I'm going to work through this um, <clears throat> idea with you today. So first I want to just kind of give an overview of this widespread fascination that I see with blockchain technology and all the great things that um, people uh, want it to be used for in our world today to transform a lot of different systems and um, talk about why it is seen as so attractive. Then I want to uh, think about a little bit about why we should care, um, why this is so significant, okay? Um, the types of systems that we're seeing blockchain imagined to transform are very significant. So I, I'll reflect on that for a little bit. And then finally, I'll get into the critical thinking part, okay? I'm a law professor. This is my bread and butter. So um, you're going to get to do it with me, okay? So uh, we'll work through those stages. So let's get started. Okay, so first of all, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, this um, fascination, this great interest that I see people having with blockchain technology. Okay, and I would say that um, a lot of its um, attraction stems from some of, these, uh, some of these facts about it that are part of its reputation. Okay, so you've all heard these terms before. You came to Scott Chain, you've heard all of these terms, right? You've heard that blockchains have immutability, they reflect truth, they are trustless, and that they have security and resilience, okay? Everybody on board with that, right? You've all heard these things. Okay, so let's talk about why those are so 
um, so important? What is it about those that makes those potentially transformational? Okay, thinking about immutability, okay, we all know what the word immutable means, right? Unchangeable, you can't mess with it, it's gonna be permanent. Okay, well this is seen as such as an important attribute because we feel like we've never really had this with record keeping before. And blockchain technology at core is just about keeping records of things, okay? If you have a record that cannot be changed, that means that you can rely on it from the moment it's created, you know, to eternity, okay? You can, you can know immediately that you can make other decisions based on what is in the record, and no one's gonna go back and say, well, actually, we crossed that out, and no, you didn't have that much money in your account, so you couldn't get that loan that we actually gave you, or ooh, um, I, I, um, you actually, um, you were due to get that appointment, but we put, we put the wrong information in, so we changed it, okay? If we can have stuff that is permanent, that's really, th that's really very important, and I think that's why people see it as so transformational. To me, that's actually as defining um, uh, characteristic that, that people talk about, immutability. When you start to think about that power, that's when I think that people get really excited about talking about all the, the possible use cases, okay? Because when you realize it's a record-keeping technology, you realize that pretty much every social practice that we engage in relies on record-keeping, okay? So that's why everyone is excited about using it for, you know, keeping track of supply chains, keeping track of um, people's academic transcripts and records, or um, insurance payments, or insurance contracts, which policy was actually in effect when. Everything relies on record keeping. So if this is a revolution in record keeping, then it is indeed kind of a new paradigm and is cross-cutting across industries. Okay, so immutability. That's why people think it's so cool. Okay, truth. You've probably seen um, statements that, you know, you can uh, count on a blockchain because it shows truth. It's gonna be valid. You can count on the data that is in it, okay? Again, another very powerful thing. If, if you can count on it being true, you know you don't have to double check it. You can go make um, your risk, uh, risk assessments of situations, make decisions based on the fact that there is something solid there that you can count on, okay? This idea of trustlessness that came up in our panel discussion, okay? Um, if you, we, this came up in the context of, you know, do we have to trust in these institutions and people running these institutions? Wouldn't it be a lot better if we didn't have to trust um, the government to keep our um, birth records, our identity records, or the banks to keep our financial records, or Equifax to keep all of our, you know, credit history records, wouldn't that be a lot better if we didn't have to rely on these um, institutions who have really failed us in a lot of ways? If we don't have to trust anyone, we can get away from those flawed institutions. Who wants to trust humans, right? We don't, it's, it's trustless. Okay, so people also, um, the final one here that I think people really like is this idea that the blockchain is secure and resilient, and that is said to come from um, it's distributed nature, in part, right? That it sits on a bunch of different computers which um, wouldn't be hackable by someone at the same time. These systems are very hard to overpower. They also have a lot of advanced cryptography in them that makes them um, uh, very resistant to hacking. And Lord knows we need that, right? Think about how everything is hacked basically every day and you can't rely, I mean, I think, my assumption is that everyone has all my information and data at this point, that nothing I have is secure. And wouldn't it be really nice to move to that world where you can count on things being secure, okay? So to me, all of these different attributes add up to something, okay? So this is a picture of Old Faithful, okay? The geyser, um, I think it's in Yellowstone, that um, goes off without fail you know, you can, tourists can go and see it, they know it's gonna sh shoot off, okay? Old Faithful. Well, I think that all of the attributes that I just described, immutability, truth, trustlessness, this idea of security and resilience, all add up to something we can count on, okay? We like blockchain technology because it gives us a feeling that it is reliable and we can count on it, okay? It feels solid. And with everything that's going on in our world, with hacking all the time, with 
um, you know, people who are viewed as, um, you know, politicians or movie stars being uh, called out all the time as not trustworthy. Wow, if we can really have something we can count on, isn't that what we've been searching for all along? Okay. So I think that's why we see all of this great excitement about the technology and what its potential could be for us. Okay, so why should we care about this? We know that you know, we have these uh, great virtues of the technology, and for that reason, we've seen use cases proposed kind of across the board. So we know that the first ones, the first kind of experimentation and excitement came in the financial services area with banks and other financial institutions uh, wanting to use the technology to transform their core systems, okay? If we can, um, and, uh, fix our record keeping processes, wow, we can speed things up and um, have no risk, uh, settlement risk, so we can, um, you know, use that money that we have to set aside for settlement risk for other things. Wow, this is going to save time, money, it's going to be really great. Okay, so um, core systems of finance, we're considering using blockchain technology. Voting is another one, right? Voting is just record keeping. You track um, and you really want to be sure that you're tracking carefully how many votes were cast for each side in an election, right? Where they cast um, and, and the, the counting process. I mean, we've seen just, you know, even in t today's world in very mature democracies, there are still often questions about how many votes actually were cast for a particular candidate and whether those votes were validly cast and how do you trust that, okay? So if we can fix voting, wow, that's really cool too. Health records, um, and uh, I, I tie, tie in with that really all other sorts of medical use cases, right? Um, it's such a hassle. Um, to figure out how your health records are distributed across the world. If we could figure out how to stream that, streamline that record keeping to where um, you know, they're all in one place, you would feel better about you know, your, the information that you're giving to your doctor is complete. We can make better decisions altogether. And the list goes on and on. Supply chain, um, property records, another extremely important system that people see this being transformational for. Okay. Um, all of these, what I see about all the ones that I have listed here, are that these are really critical social systems. And it's really important that they work, okay? If we can't rely on voting records, for instance, you have questions about legitimacy in elections, and those lead to bad places. I think we've all, uh, all seen that over the past several years. Questions about legitimacy of records matter. Financial systems, those are also critical systems for our societies, right? Um, we saw in the global financial crisis that people not being able to rely on records about who owed what to who, who owned what, that was part of the spiral that happened. And faulty record keeping, um, um, unreliable records in that domain can have actual implications for global financial stability, okay? We're not playing around with the areas that we um, are envisioning using blockchain technology for, okay? We're talking about using them for extremely critical things. Of course, I acknowledge that we're also talking about using them for, you know, um, less important things as well, meaning less critical to society continuing to run, okay? Um, and uh, Dave Birch made reference to some of those uh, potential use cases, but we are uh, thinking about them for a lot of really important stuff. So that's, um, that's why I think this critical thinking um, message is, is so important to me. Okay, so let's get to it. Let's get to this critical thinking part. Okay, so I want to think about these um, attributes that I described earlier. Um, from a critical perspective, okay? And I'm really gonna focus on the first one, immutability, because um, I see that to be the defining characteristic of blockchain technology. And um, I think that we have to know what we're really meaning when we use that term. Okay, so immutability, we say that means it cannot be changed. 
And you've noticed probably that when you read um, any piece on blockchain technology, whether it's in a newspaper, well, no one reads newspapers, but whether it's on the web in a news article or whether it's in an academic journal, something you read on SSRN, various places, you hear blockchain technology is, creates immutable records, kind of full stop. Okay? There's no nuance about, well, this flavor of blockchain technology creates immutable records, but this one creates something that is you know, sort of immutable. Okay? It's always stated as, Blockchain records are immutable. Does, is that a fair characterization of the world as you see it? How many of you regularly describe blockchain records as immutable? Yeah, okay, so lots of people here. Okay, I think immutable is totally the wrong word, okay? So I'll just be honest with you. I think immutable needs to be stricken from the lexicon. I would just cancel it all the way around, okay? I will say it here, blockchain records are not immutable. Okay? And I'll tell you why I think that, and I'll tell you why I think it matters that we're using the wrong word here. Okay. Why I think they're not immutable, first. I think they're not immutable for two reasons. First of which is that it's been empirically demonstrated that they're not immutable. Okay? What am I talking about? You know what I'm talking about. You yourself have seen this empirical evidence. Okay? So, the records that I think, the type of blockchains that create records that I think have the best claim to be, you know, approaching immutability are probably public blockchains, like those of Bitcoin or Ethereum, right? These, um, the open blockchains where anyone can join the network. Well, we have evidence that they're not immutable, okay? The first one that um, is a clear, clear demonstration of this is in March 2013 when the Bitcoin blockchain split into two parts, okay, split into two ledgers because computers in the network that maintains the ledger, the mining network, were running different versions of the software, okay, and that led to this split in the record that was being created. Well, this is kind of a problem, right, since our whole point here is to have one reliable record that you can count on. So the core developers, who are the, you know, small group, about five people or so that actually make changes to the code, make proposals for how the code should change in this organization, non-organization, unacknowledged organization, whatever you want to call it, um, they made a decision about which record was going to be true, okay? And to implement that decision, they needed to persuade members of the validating network to move to their true ledger. So what did they do? They started contacting people people in the mining network who had enough power to make a difference, enough computing power, hashing power in the network to make a difference. They persuaded those people to go over to one certain ledger. Those people had to give up earnings that they had had on the now considered untrue ledger. Okay? So the ledger was changed. It was revised. It was not immutable. Okay? We also saw this with um, the Ethereum split last summer. right? Everyone in this room who is talking about blockchain technology no doubt knows about the DAO, okay? Um, the distributed aut autonomous organization that was launched to great fanfare, raised a ton of money, and then was very uh, quickly exploited, had the code exploited by someone who moved a bunch of tokens to their own account. Okay, so right, this face, uh, this, this had the Ethereum core development team faced with a very difficult decision. Do we con continue with this record that you know, manifests the theft, or do we move to a different record? And they decided to treat this as a theft and to revise the record. Okay? That meant they had to roll out new code that would, in effect, erase the theft from it and then proceed onward. Okay? The core developers were able to persuade enough of the mining network that this was a good idea, and that change was rolled out to the network, meaning you know, there was a big revision to the code and, and to the record that was created. Of course, some of the people didn't agree that it should be changed, and they kept going with Ethereum Classic, where the record reflects the theft. What are the lessons from this? Okay. The Ethereum record certainly is not immutable, and the Bitcoin record is not immutable. And to me, those are demonstrable um, instances that show us that 
the people who are involved in keeping the record, the people within the system, whatever the system is, are the ones who are in control. Okay? So calling something immutable, acting as if it is out of the people's control who are running and operating the system, I think is very deceptive. And, um, and, and I'll talk in a moment why I think these are really, it's a really consequential thing to refer to things as immutable when that overstates the capabilities. Okay, so those are my two empirical, um, what I call empirical evidence of non-immutability. Okay, the other, um, the other argument I have about immutability um, is a more conceptual one. And um, it has to do with all the uncertainty and experimentation that is happening with blockchain technology. Okay, we know we started with these systems coming from the cryptocurrency world, the public blockchains, but there has been a, um, a lot of experimentation and many of the blockchains that we're seeing worked on today are private blockchains, right? Where you have a group of validators in the network who are known and trusted, okay? So there are lots of different flavors, there are lots of different consensus mechanisms that are happening here, okay? So, Against that backdrop, um, my argument about immutability is that immutability is actually kind of an emergent property of these systems. Okay? An emergent property is something that you know, emerges from um, a whole series of events that happen within a system. So with a cake, you get a moist cake if you follow the instructions of the recipe, how long you bake it, whether you put in the, the, the right temperature, whether you put in real butter. And if you change some of the ingredients along the way in your recipe or how long you bake it, you might not get a cake that actually turns out to be moist. Okay? I think there is a strong analogy um, with that to blockchain technology and immutability. Okay? Um, public blockchains are said to give forth outsprings immutability, but there is a lot of debate amongst technologists about what actually creates that emergent property. Is it the proof of work consensus mechanism? Is it the cryptography that is used? What is it? We don't know, and there is actual debate. So my argument is, is that if we don't know what's actually giving rise to this immutability, and we are experimenting with whole lots of different flavors here, why are we so sure that all of these different variations are going to give us the same immutable record or the same moist cake? When some people are using artificial butter, some people are, are baking at 500 degrees for 30 minutes, others are baking for an hour. Okay? I, I don't think it works out. So my proposal for the new word, new series of words that we should use is hard to change. And <laughs> it's really catchy, right? <laughs> Blockchains create a record that is hard to change, okay? And the reason I think that distinction is important is because immutable is such an absolute word, okay? And it may give people more trust in the record than it should or can bear, okay? So think about, um, think about the consequences in the, that the U.S. suffered and then we rippled it out kindly to the rest of the world with our subprime mortgage crisis. Okay? and how we um, sliced and diced these subprime mortgages up into mortgage-backed securities and then sold them with, ooh, AAA ratings, risk-free, full stop. It matters how you characterize things. Okay? People relied on that to be true and then built it into other assumptions that they made. Okay? And remember when I'm talking about these very critical systems, social systems that we are counting on, okay? it matters that every characteristic that you're stating about the technology that you're being honest and accurate about it, precise about it. So let's call it hard to change instead of immutable. Okay, it's not as catchy, but let's do it. Okay, so there we go. Okay, um, I'm not going to go into each of these others um, in as great of depth as I did with immutability, but I will say that um, I think truth, that the blockchain inevitably reflects truth, is similarly problematic. And I think that because um, you might be able to say that about how the records show the movement and each transaction that a token native to the system um, goes through. Okay, you can trace the movements of a Bitcoin or um, Ether, whatever, through the system. But the moment that you start bringing in outside information, building on top of these tokens, information from the outside world, 
bad information can come in, and just because it ends up appearing on a blockchain record does not mean that it is true. Okay? So people could mistakenly enter information about their health record or how much a payment was, and just because it shows up on the blockchain doesn't mean they didn't make a mistake in doing that. Okay? So again, I think this is important because assumptions that you make about the technology end up flowing through to decisions down the road. Okay, trustlessness. I foreshadowed this a little bit in my talk in the, the panel, but um, you know, the idea that we don't have to trust these corrupt and flawed institutions or other people because we're trusting code here. Okay? First of all, I think that this um, clearly only potentially applies in the blockchain setting because in the, uh, in the public blockchain setting, because in the private blockchain setting, I mean, the whole premise of it is that you trust the people that you're letting into the network, right? So there's cl it's a clearly a network based on, founded on trust. So trustless makes no sense in the context of a private blockchain. I also think it makes no sense in the context of a public blockchain because, again, you have people doing real things that everyone who is participating or relying on or using or building on top of the blockchain is counting on, okay? the core developers who I mentioned who make very critical decisions that affect everyone doing anything on top of the blockchain, right? The mining network who decides which version of the code they actually want to run, and you better hope they're vetting that code before they decide to run it. Exchanges within the systems who decide which tokens from a split are going to end up being listed and or one will die, okay? You're relying on people. I think trustless is completely a misnomer. Security and resilience. Um, I'm, I'm not going to say a lot about this, but I will just point to um, the, uh, the, the Judge Business School at Cambridge who recently came out with a, a whole global benchmarking study about blockchain technology. And probably many of you have read it because it got like 4,000 downloads or something the first day they released it. Um, that study um, lists actually four myths about blockchain technology. And one of those is that it can unquestionably be described as secure, full stop. Okay? It might be more secure than existing technologies, but certainly with blo public blockchains, they're vulnerable to, at the moment, 51% attacks, and no one has figured out, or no one has given me a good explanation about why we shouldn't assume that those could happen from a state actor or a terrorist organization who isn't going to benefit financially from destroying the system, but might get a lot of other stuff out of it. Okay? So um, security and resilience was on um, not just my list, but the, the Cambridge um, report about blockchain technologies as being one that's a bit overstated. I will be happy to tell you now that they also had my other three myths on there. They don't like immutable either, they don't like truth, and they don't like trustlessness. So, that was really reassuring to see, I have to say. <laughs> okay, so what I think is important here is that we not throw out everything and say, well, this will never work, right? I think that it's important, as I said, to try and get to an enlightened perspective, okay? A nuanced perspective about the technology. Okay? A realistic understanding of the technology, its characteristics, its capabilities, is much more useful than what I would call an idealistic um, understanding of the technology. Push hard on everything that you're told about it because you can make better decisions and you might not up, end up in a world where p you assume that mortgage-backed securities are AAA or risk-free just because someone labeled them that way. Press hard on the labels. So how do we get to enlightenment? I'm going to leave you here with some suggestions for how we approach this, what, what I think would be a great mindset for dealing with this technology. Okay, ask the hard questions. What do you mean by immutable? Is it really true that it can never be changed? Are we considering all the possibilities here? Okay, um, is it really true that we're not counting on other people to make important decisions that we're relying on? Ask those questions and don't be, you know, don't be satisfied with yes as the answer, okay? Make people explain it, make people defend it. 
Insist on precise, accurate communication. That's really my whole message here, right? Don't assume that, um, don't say immutable unless you really mean immutable, okay? Don't say it's true unless you really mean it. Be clear about a variation of the technology that you're talking about because I think that with all the different flavors that we're seeing, probably each of them have different capabilities, okay? So don't assume that everything in the bucket that we call blockchain technology has the same capabilities. Be very alert to hype. It is all over the place here, okay? And therefore, it is very hard to know which sources to trust in this, you know, trustless world, right? We've got the technology to make the trust, the trust machine for us, but there is a whole lot of hype out there and it's very difficult. So press on the sources that you are reading to see if they really stand up under close analysis. Consider the source and the source's incentives, okay? This space is full of, um, probably as most you know, new technology spaces are, full of um, thought leaders and people who, um, uh, people who want to give you a wonderful vision of the future. Well, that's very necessary about any, any new technology, but you need to think about their incentives in it as well. Okay, and um, related to the considering the source, being alert to hype, you can't assume that just because something comes from a particularly uh, prestigious source, it's necessarily true because people use these words, mutable, trustless, blah, blah, blah. Of course, I recognize that goes totally against what I just told you about the Cambridge report, but I don't know. <laughs> you have to figure it out. I, I trust the Cambridge report because I read it myself and it uh, survived my critical analysis. Seek diverse perspectives. Listen to people who say it's gonna change the world, who say it's gonna change the world a little bit, and others who say it's the worst thing ever, okay? That will help you figure out your own viewpoint. Doubt everything, assume nothing, okay? Meaning, the features, the core features of the technology are not settled yet, it's immature. Technologists working in the space will tell you that they're still figuring things out to a certain extent. That means you can't build on these assumptions as if they are all settled, okay? It's, we're experimenting with it, we're learning together. And resist peer pressure, I would say. Don't just jump on um, and uh, repeat what someone else has told you about the technology and say it's great because someone else told you. Think for yourself, I would say. So these are very you know, general principles that I would say are probably good for any kind of analysis, um, but I think they do apply to our blockchain setting today. So I think that if we're going to make the most of this technology and transform the systems that absolutely need to be transformed, I don't want you to think that I'm trying to defend all of our systems as acceptable or good or anything like that. All I'm saying is that especially when you're dealing with critical systems, you need to understand what you're moving to and make sure that you're moving carefully to that new world. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. <laughs>